Welcome. Welcome to this place. This is a home where no revealed truths are promoted and no scripture or human being is accepted as infallible. This is a place for searching for truth, but we are believers. We believe in intellectual freedom. We believe in justice. We believe in compassion and concern for each other and for the whole world. We believe in commitment to those ideals which make us caring and active in the struggles for human dignity. We are Unitarian Universalists. At this time, we have an opportunity to light our candles of community at the back table. You can light a candle for a joy or a concern or simply to bring more light into our space. To admit there sometimes during that video it reminded me of my dad using the camcorder when I was growing up for our vacations. <laughs> Let us stand in body or spirit for our chalice lighting, our spoken affirmation, and the lighting of the peace candle. We light this chalice to affirm that new light is ever waiting to break through to enlighten our ways. That new truth is ever waiting to break through to illumine our minds. And that new love is ever waiting to break through to warm our hearts. May we be open to this light and to the rich possibilities that it brings. Let us join together in the spoken affirmation. Love, love is, is the, the spirit, spirit of this church and, and service is, is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek truth and freedom, and to help one another. We light this peace candle to remind us of all the places in the world where there is no peace. Join me in the words now on the screen. Lead me from death to life, from falsehood to truth, Lead me from despair to hope, from fear to trust. Lead me from hate to love, from war to peace. Let peace fill our hearts, our world, our universe. 
Be seated. Our opening thought comes from this very old book <laughs> from Borden Parker Baum titled Personalism. A few of his ideas about God. Likewise, the God of theology for a long time hardly attained to any real active goodness, such as the thought of ethical love implies. This God, too, was rather metaphysically conceived, and this God's holiness consisted mainly in making rules for persons and in punishing their transgression. This God was conceived largely after the fashion of the medieval despot and the conception of any obligation on God's part to God's creatures would have been looked upon almost as blasphemy. But now we have begun to think more clearly and profoundly as to what ethical love demands. And with this thought, the immoral, selfish, and indifferent gods are disappearing and the God of theology also has been greatly modified. We see that the law of love applies to power as well as to weakness, that the strong ought to bear the burdens of the weak and not to please themselves, that the greatest of all must be the servant of all and the chief of burden bearers. My life flows on in endless song above earth's lamentation. I hear the real, the far off hymn that hails a new creation. Through all the tumult and the strife, I hear the music ringing. It sounds an echo. How can I keep from singing? What the tempest round me roars, I know the truth it lives. What the darkness round me flows, songs in the night it giveth. No storm can shake my inmost song. Next reading comes from the biography titled Borden Parker Baum, authored by Francis John McConnell, who was a bishop in the United in the Methodist Episcopal Church. This reading is from the words of Baum when he was asked his views concerning the virgin birth within Christianity, Bound writes, I certainly do not deny it. At the same time, I should strongly protest against making it an article of the standing or falling of the faith of the church. 
It can never be put to any decisive test. It will be held because of its beauty and aesthetic fitness as, an inaug as inaugurating a new era in the great order of divine revelation. But in any case, the doctrine is nothing which affects our fundamental Christian ideas at all. Nothing of importance depends on it. The person of Christ and his incarnation are the important thing and not the manner of his birth. We now come to our practices, which I almost skipped. Let us have a time of meditation. And we'll be hearing these words from Leslie Takahashi, Marginal Wisdom. Let us take a breath in and a breath out. Breathe in and out. They teach us to read in black and white. Truth is this, the rest false. You are whole or broken. Who you love is acceptable or not. Life tells its truth in many hues. We are taught to think in either or, to believe the teachings of Jesus or Buddha, to believe in human potential or a power beyond a single will. I am broken or I am powerful. Life embraces multiple truths speaks of both and of and. We are taught to see in absolutes, good versus evil, male versus female, old versus young, gay versus straight. Let us see the fractions, the spectrum, the margins, let us open our hearts to the complexity of our worlds. Let us make our lives sanctuaries to nurture our many identities. The day is coming when all will know that the rainbow world is more gorgeous than the monochrome that a river of identities can ebb and flow over the static, stubborn rocks in its course, that the margin holds the center.
next reading also comes from Borden Parker Bound by Francis John McConnell. <clears throat> In this reading, we hear of the charges that were brought against the Methodist minister and professor of philosophy at Boston University, Borden Parker Bound, in 1904. In the spring of 1904, at the session of the New York East Conference of the Methodist Episcopal Church, of which Dr. Bound was a member, charges of heretical teaching were brought against him by a member of another annual conference. These charges were wholly based on passages taken from several of his published works. He was charged with teaching one, doctrines which are contrary to the Articles of Religion of the Methodist Episcopal Church. Two, doctrines which are contrary to the established standards of the doctrine of the Methodist Episcopal Church. First specification, he denies the Trinitarian conception of the deity and also the moral attributes of the deity as set forth in the first and fourth Articles of Religion of the Methodist Episcopal Church. This specification was followed by extended quotations from Bounds' books, The Metaph Metaphysics and Philosophy of Theism. Second specification, his teaching on miracles is such as to weaken, if not destroy, faith in large portions of the Old and New Testament. His views on the inspiration of Scripture are contrary to the teachings of the Scriptures themselves. Contrary to Article 5 of the Articles of Religion of the Methodist Episcopal Church and tend to destroy faith in the authority of the Bible in matters of faith and practice. Quotations from Bound's booklet on the Christian Revelation were then read. Third specification, he denies the doctrine of the atonement as set forth in the second and twentieth Articles of Religion of the Methodist Episcopal Church and as taught by our established standards of doctrine. Quotation from Bound's booklet on the atonement. Fourth specification. He teaches such views of the divine government and of the future of souls as to destroy the force of Christ's teaching about the future punishment of the wicked and the future reward of the righteous. Quotations from the atonement and metaphysics. Fifth specification, he teaches views on the subject of sin and salvation, on repentance, justification, regeneration, and assurance of salvation through the witness of the Spirit that do not represent the views of the Methodist Episcopal Church as expressed in our standard works of theology. Then it goes on to list the 15 bishops who were selected out of the Council of Bishops to be uh, the jury for this trial. I will not bore you with reading their names. <laughs> Sing out loud on this one.
In the history of religions, the enforcement of adherence to prescribed doctrinal purity, or doctrinal purity, as we like to say in Oklahoma, has almost never been about love or justice or about a sincere search for truth, but rather about preserving religious and social institutional authority and control. It's no surprise that the vast majority of persons who are obsessed with enforcing doctrinal purity within religions that developed in patriarchal cultures are men. One might even be tempted to call them doctrinal purity bros. <laughs> <laughs> One of the most telling signs that persons have succumbed to an imperial version of Christianity is when they start throwing around the word heresy. They throw this word around to describe theological views that differ from their own and then attempt to enforce what they perceive to be the correct theology through institutional sanctions to punish the heretic. This is the attitude, by the way, that leads to crusades, inquisitions, colonialism, church trials, and worse. And now it is fueling various forms of Christian nationalism around the world. Like the hideously sadistic theological construct of hell, the concept of heresy is a theological and political construct used to cur curtail freedom of thought and to control the masses for the sake of maintaining and expanding both ecclesial and often imperial power. It has been used to justify burning books and burning people. Both of the constructs of hell and heresy are devoid of love and serve as tools for injustice, oppression, and violence. The establishment of orthodoxy as opposed to heresy <laughs> often has more to do with the institutionalization of religion and its negotiating of relations with its social and cultural context than it has to do with the cultivation of the beloved community. In the case of Christianity, what is now considered orthodox by the majority of Christians in the world is closely linked to the partnership of church and empire during and after the time of Constantine, with what was determined to be orthodox at the Council of Nicaea being enforced by imperial violence. It should be noted that the use of imperial violence to enforce one set of beliefs and doctrines over others is actually a quite effective tool for determining what members of a religion will agree upon as being orthodoxy <laughs> and agree upon what's considered heresy. It's very effective, but it's also evil. When religion focuses on eradicating whatever it defines as heresy to enforce correct belief, it easily becomes putty in the hands of those who seek to control people for political and economic gain. Within my own denomination, uh, the United Methodist Church, there are many persons who now hold a more metaphorical interpretation of miracles and the scripture. And there are also many persons within the United Methodist Church who still hold a more literal interpretation of miracles in scripture. And I believe it's okay that we have differing perspectives within the United Methodist Church. A problem arises, however, when persons with one perspective attempt to force their beliefs on those with a different perspective. This does not preclude healthy debate or disagreements, 
but it should preclude vilifying those who think and believe differently and attempting to force them to change their views. Now, fortunately, in the Methodist tradition and now the United Methodist tradition, ever since Methodist minister and Boston University professor Borden Parker Baum, who lived from 1847 to 1910, ever since he was put on trial for heresy in 1904, 120 years ago, for his metaphorical interpretation of miracles and scripture, and then was acquitted by those 15 bishops unanimously, ever since then, it has been, if not generally acceptable, at least acceptable for Methodists to hold such a metaphorical perspective. So I'm thankful for my philosophical and theological great grandfather, so to speak, and Borden Parker Bound. I call him my philosophical and theological great-grandfather because he was the professor of Edgar Sheffield Brightman, and Edgar Sheffield Brightman was the professor of Walter Mulder, and Walter Mulder was the professor of Mark Davies. <laughs> so he is my kind of intellectual great-grandfather. He taught at Boston University, and he founded the school of thought called Boston Personalism. Most people haven't heard of Boston Personalism today, but it was a way of thinking that became the philosophical underpinning of Martin Luther King Jr.'s vision of the dignity and value of all persons in beloved community. Bounds' theistic naturalism got him into trouble. Theistic naturalism is the belief that God works through natural methods. And there has to be a really good reason for God not to work through natural methods. That got him into trouble with conservatives in the Methodist Episcopal Church. And in 1904, he endured this heresy trial in which, as I mentioned before, he was unanimously acquitted. One would hope the days of heresy trials over theological and philosophical differences in Methodism are a thing of the past, one would hope. The philosophy department uh, at Boston University pays tribute to, Boston, to a Borden Parker Bound on their webpage uh, as being someone who worked for academic freedom to protect the autonomy of the university from the overreach of the church, and they, they pay this tribute with these words. Borden Parker Bound made one other contribution to the department. He won for it the freedom of learning. When the openness to the secular world incurred the wrath of the more traditional dignitaries of the Methodist Church, it was Bound, who as dean of the graduate school defended the autonomy of the university against the church. He got himself charged with heresy for his pains and underwent a harrowing trial. At no time, though, did he deny what he was teaching. Rather, he insisted that the freedom of inquiry is a part of the freedom with which Christ has set us free. His premature death at 62 may well have been hastened by the trial, but he won for us the freedom we now take for granted. The freedom we now take for granted. In 1895, there was a professor by the name of Hinckley Mitchell, who was an Old Testament professor at Boston University School of Theology, and he came under serious attack from the conservatives in the Methodist Episcopal Church. For years, for 15 years, uh, Mitchell taught the truth exactly as he saw it, <laughs> without much opposition. But in the last years of his time at Boston University, he came under significant attack because he was teaching 
views about the Old Testament, what we now refer to as the Hebrew Bible, that now are commonly held among biblical scholars around the, around the world, that they were written at different times by different groups, uh, were not authored, for example, the, the Pentateuch was not authored by Moses. These were the kinds of things that he was teaching. And the Methodist Episcopal Church at the time was not yet ready for that to be taught in its seminary. So he actually was removed in 1905 because back then, every five years, you had to have two bishops sign on to you being reappointed to your teaching position as well as the university. Now, in 1895, Bound started coming to the defense of Mitchell. And in 1900, he especially came to the defense of Mitchell. Uh, and Bound himself said he would not tolerate dogmatism. But unfortunately, in 1905, while Bound was actually out of the country, uh, Mitchell was removed. In this defense of Mitchell, <clears throat> Bound also came into the, I think, the, the, the eyesight of many of the conservatives uh, in, the, in the church, and they began to put pressure on him as well. Here were some of the things that they probably didn't like about Bound. <laughs> As I said, he would not tolerate dogmatism. He also had an attitude toward miracles that conservatives in the Methodist Episcopal Church did not like. What he objected to was the dictum that we must say that miracle must be or must not be. It wasn't that he was against the idea of miracles in general, but insisting that they were or were not the case was a problem for him. In looking at the story of Jonah, and the big fish, he once told a conference, look, if, if by holding to the literal nature of the story of Jonah, it, it, that's the only way that you're able to hold to your commitment to expressing the love of Christ in the world, go ahead. They, they applauded. <laughs> then he added, don't ask me to believe in the literalness. Don't ask me to believe in the literalness. He set aside biblical inerrancy and infallibility. He did not believe in biblical inerrancy or biblical infallibility. He saw religious revelation as instrumental. It was instrumental. What effect does religious revelation have on moral, human, and spiritual insight? That's what was important about Revelation, not the miracles, not the supernatural incidents, but the effect on moral, human, and spiritual insight. So he was charged with heresy in 1904 and brought to trial. The charges should have been dismissed, but there was a presiding elder in relation to the trial, in relation to the charges that wanted to see it go on to trial, to, to settle the matter, and Bound himself agreed to bring it to trial in order to settle the matter. So the trial went forward with Bound's consent, but it really was an indignity uh, to Bound at the time and was a difficult uh, experience for him. The charges, you heard them. He wasn't Trinitarian. He had false teachings on miracles. He denied the doctrine of atonement, they said. He denies hell. His views on sin, salvation, repentance, justification, regeneration, and assurance of salvation are all not in line with the teachings of the Methodist Episcopal Church. Well, the bishops thought otherwise. Bound defended himself charge by charge. He put forward his, his views, and in many cases, it was clearly a metaphorical interpretation of scripture and tradition that he was putting forward, and he was acquitted by all 15 bishops, a unanimous acquittal. 120 years ago, you'd think that would be uh, it, 
But today, the United Methodist Church is not fully free of persons making complaints of heresy, making threats of putting persons on trial for heresy. But 120 years ago, Borden Parker Bound took one for the team by standing up to the doctrinal purity bros of his time in defense of free thinking in the life of both the church and the university. One of the great barriers, though, today within my denomination of United Methodism, one of the great barriers of, barriers of fully living into becoming a just and inclusive denomination that embraces the truth wherever it may be found is that our ministers have been conditioned by our ecclesial structures and our ecclesial authorities to be afraid to be afraid of talking to their congregations about what we have learned in our United Methodist seminaries. <laughs> if you go to United Methodist seminaries, none of what Bound was saying or teaching is controversial in the least. These are common perspectives that are being taught United Methodist can candidates for ministry in United Methodist seminaries all over the United States. But the ecclesial structures and authorities make the ministers afraid to talk to their congregations about what they've learned. Because in our denomination, you do well in your career as a minister if you bring in more people, if you bring in more money, if you build more buildings, if you baptize more persons if you have more confessions of faith that's the measurement upon which the success of a clergy career is often made and it's difficult sometimes to do those things if you tell people what you learned in seminary <laughs> hopefully hopefully the united methodist church today can avoid getting caught up in this obsession with enforcing doctrinal purity and live more fully into the reality that the truth of a religion is related to the love, justice, and peace that it expresses, not to the beliefs about miracles that it espouses. At this time, we have an opportunity for giving. You can give online or also at the table here in the room.
stand together in body or spirit for a closing thought and extinguishing the chalice. Our closing thought comes to us today from Thich Nhat Hanh and his book, Being Peace. Aware of the suffering brought about when we impose our views on others, we are committed not to force others, even our children, by any means whatsoever, such as authority, threat, money, propaganda, or indoctrination, to adopt our views. We will respect the right of others to be different and to choose what to believe and how to decide. We will, however, help others renounce fanaticism and narrowness through compassionate dialogue. Let us join together in extinguishing the chalice. We extinguish these flames, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again.